Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. I still remember the first time I took acid like it just happened yesterday. It's just one of those things, like the first time someone falls in love, or the first time someone has a child of their own. It becomes a watershed moment in the mind, a marker for the past. I had just turned 17 a month earlier. My friend Ryan came up to me. Jay, are you still interested in trying acid? He said. My jaw dropped. I had done mushrooms before, but finding acid around here in our rural town felt like searching for the Holy Grail. Is it real? I whispered, excited. Well, everyone who has tried it says so, he said, his blue eyes gleaming with excitement. He had freckles on his light Irish skin, a chubby frame, and a dark sense of humor like myself. He also loved Tool and Alex Gray and a perfect circle, among other things, and we bonded over these. We used to have sleepovers where we would pack a bong with cannabis, but secretly put 20XX Salvia Divinorum Extract underneath the layer of freshly ground buds. I got him real good a few times, and he would always start slurring and say, Oh, damn it, you bastard before going off to that horrible place around the bend where the salvia spirit reigns supreme. The next day we had a fire alarm. Ryan had gotten the acid the previous night and our paths ended up crossing in the parking lot. I walked over and he stared right through me. It was eerie. He looked right at me, but at the same time he looked beyond me. How was it? I asked excitedly. He had taken LSD for the first time in his life the previous night. Jesus, it was intense, he said, a thin layer of sweat coating his face. I didn't sleep all night. It felt like forever. I shouldn't have taken three hits at once. I nearly lost my shit a few times. I laughed at that. I knew I would never lose my shit. How intense could LSD be? It was just a chemical that made pretty colors swirl in your vision and slowed down time, right? I gave him $20 and he gave me three little pieces of white paper and some tinfoil. This shit is strong, he warned me. I nodded and we parted ways. The last period of that day, I took out one of the hits and put it in my mouth. By the time the class ended 55 minutes later, I felt like a man in the eye of a hurricane. Colors swirled around me, whizzing in a blur, covering all the hallways and floors in morphing kaleidoscopic patterns. I walked home from school. Once I got to the empty baseball fields behind the school, I sat in the dugouts, packed a bowl and smoked it. It was a mistake, and by the time I stood up again, I felt like I was tripping so hard that I didn't know what the hell was going on anymore. I staggered home somehow and put on some, a perfect circle. Three Libras was playing in my room, but I felt paranoid and constantly watched. I heard voices coming from the house and I knew I needed to get away. I ran outside without talking to anyone, heading for the woods near my house. I began hallucinating that the police were chasing me. Every time a car drove by, I expected it to suddenly swerve to the side of the road and a plainclothes officer to jump out and point a gun at me. Then maybe they would take me to some cold, dark torture chamber with fresh blood coating the steel tables. I heard megaphones blasting warnings from the police towards me, but I couldn't figure out where they were coming from. Jay. Give yourself up. We know what you did. We have you surrounded, it exclaimed, echoing across the pavement and the hills. I looked around frantically. I didn't do anything, I said, running towards the woods. I heard three Libras blasting out from every tree as I drew near, as if thousands of speakers had somehow been wired to the forest. Paranoid, I quickly left the trail and got lost. I don't know how long I wandered in those woods, but the sun hadn't fully set when I left. I would guess about five or six hours passed, but to me, it seemed like an eternity. In those five or six hours, I experienced total ego loss. My first experience with LSD would leave a deep and permanent impression on my mind, one that will last until I die, and maybe even after that, if consciousness continues. I remember staggering through spider webs, freaking out and ripping the crawling predators off my clothes. Ticks crawled on me, and I had a sense of overwhelming anxiety about the ticks and spiders, thinking they had gotten into my clothes. I had a little notepad with me and in bizarre scrawls, 
I wrote nonsensical sentences. The sun is standing on my shoulder. The shadow people hide behind the trees. This has happened before. The trees bent in towards me, and the ground rippled up and down in endless beautiful waves. When I closed my eyes, I saw a morphing wall of colors, like a Persian carpet melting into new designs. That was just my first time. I learned how to control acid after a while. By this point in my life, I've eaten tens of thousands of hits, but nothing ever gets you like the first time. Rin. Now twenty years have passed, and a lot has happened since that April day in high school. I ended up meeting some members of the Grateful Dead families through mutual friends and by going to music festivals. People who introduced me to the source of much of the acid in the United States. Old hippies who have been passing down the recipes from big hand to small over the generations. Even though the Grateful Dead has been disbanded for years since Jerry Garcia died, the families still usually call themselves the Dead, or Rainbow Families. But this isn't an autobiography of how I got involved in distributing millions of hits of acid. The horrors I witnessed occurred on a single trip out in the desert yesterday, when things went unimaginably, horribly wrong during an initiation of a new member. Ryan and I pulled up to the site in the SUV, loaded with camping gear, food, beer, coffee, and everything else we would need. I got out and lit a cigarette, looking across the endless dunes, seeing the naked scrub brush reaching skywards with its crooked branches like arms raised in prayer. We started setting up the campsite when another car pulled up behind us. Out of it came the de facto leader of our little family and his new initiate, followed by one young woman that I knew well, a newer member of the family named Isabella. The way the October sun glinted off her earrings made me pause. The blinding light reminded me of something, but I couldn't remember. I wanted to stop the whole thing right there. My intuition screamed at me to shut everything down, my subconscious sending forth waves of dread through my mind. The new member, a young man with tanned skin and a small gap in his front teeth, seemed like a fairly chill person. He smiled all the time, so we called him Smiley. With his long black hair constantly covered in a steal-your-face hat and his muscular frame, he reminded me of one of Robin Hood's merry men, like a medieval character brought to the present and given a tie-dye shirt and some ripped blue jeans. But strange things seemed to happen around him. I didn't know if psychic powers or mind reading or anything actually existed, but I couldn't find any other explanation. The week before, I had marked the first anniversary of the death of my mother. I hadn't told anyone, drinking away most of the day in sadness at random bars. When sunset came, I went back to my hotel room and laid down, deciding to sleep the rest of the horrible day away. As soon as I started falling asleep, I heard a hard knocking at my door. I rose from the bed, lethargically moving towards the door. As soon as I opened it, I saw Smiley standing there, not looking like his normal happy self. Your mother wants you to know that your grandmother and grandfather are with her, reunited at last, he said, his eyes looking blank. His pupils seemed to expand and contract before my eyes, his eyes vibrating and twitching to the left and right in small spasmodic movements. On an eternal beach they lay, staring up into a dead star. When I asked him about this later, he didn't remember any of it. He claimed he had a problem with sleepwalking and sleep-talking. Yet this hadn't been the only time Smiley had exhibited strange powers. Storms had a tendency to follow him wherever he went, vicious eruptions of lightning and hail that would shake the ground. And when Ryan's dog ran away, Smiley had been able to wander through the pitch-dark woods and bring it back without even seeing where it had gone. There were other times, too many to count. I had a strange feeling about keeping Smiley around, one that I didn't share with anyone else in the group. You ever done a thumbprint before, Smiley? I asked him that morning. He shook his head. The thumbprint, I probably should explain what it is. To become a member of any Crystal LSD family, an initiate must do what is called a thumbprint. This involves sticking one's thumb into a pile of Crystal LSD and licking it off. LSD is extremely potent, and a single hit is about one-tenth of a milligram, smaller than a grain of salt when seen in crystalline form. A thumbprint is therefore a massive dose. If I had to guess, I would say it is the equivalent of taking between 1,000 to 3,000 hits of acid at once. 
It kicks in instantly, and it is one of the most intense experiences a living human being can ever know. Since LSD is non-toxic physically, it poses no risk to the body, even at incredibly high doses, but psychologically it can destroy someone who is not ready for it. Because of this, we work our way up to a thumbprint. Many of the family members will eat 30, 40, or 50 hits a day to get their tolerance up and push the limits of their consciousness before embarking on a thumbprint. No one ever just goes into a thumbprint blind. Some people have talked about near-death experiences. The thumbprint is a beyond-death experience. People who take this dose of LSD see themselves dying and often hear the voice of God, deep and roaring like the sound of rushing water. They go into the light and what they see there cannot be explained. I could say they see the divine heart of Jesus, or Nirvana, or an eternal consciousness, but none of that would really describe it. They're just words after all, and people too often confuse the map for the actual territory. I can tell you, I have never met a single person who has done a thumbprint who did not believe in life after death. To get to that level of psychedelic awareness, one must have a great deal of inner peace and spirituality. Any anxieties or depressions would be massively amplified by 1,000 or more hits of acid, and some people have tried to commit suicide during the thumbprint experience, even attempting to jump out of windows. Therefore, any time a thumbprint was given, at least five or six members of the family would attend in addition to the initiate, and at least two members of the family would have to vouch for the initiate. Hey, Jay, let me ask you a question, Smiley said, looking anxious and pale. He stared directly into my eyes. I saw an iron determination there, and an inner calmness, as well as a strange underlying energy that I couldn't put my finger on. How many thumbprints have you done in your life? I've done three, I said, and each time it was the most intense experience of my life. Are you sure you want to do this? Once you start it, you can't go back. After that, the only way out is forwards, and it's a long, hard road. It's a long, strange trip, my friend. He smiled at that. Yes, I'm sure. I think I'm ready. Let's do this. I nodded, taking out the small vial of crystal LSD from my pants pocket. LSD was so potent that a vial that could fit into my hand would hold millions of hits. The leader of our group, a tall elderly man we called China Cat, watched the laying out of the crystal with rapt attention, making sure the ritual was followed to the letter. China Cat's warm brown eyes sparkled as I poured thousands of hits of the white crystal out onto a leather-bound copy of the Bible, his wrinkled face forming into a grin. Smiley reached his right thumb into the direct center of the pile, where the crystal LSD was thickest, covering the entire top half of his digit with it. Whoa, soldier, I said. That's a hefty dose, are you sure? I began saying as he quickly raised it to his mouth, licking the thousands of hits off. It had to be one of the largest doses I had ever seen anyone take, at least four or five thousand hits if I had to guess. Ryan stood next to me and I gave him a worried look. His eyes looked wide and uncertain. I didn't know if Smiley realized what he had just done, as people doing thumbprints usually pressed their thumb into the side of the pile, where the crystal was sparser. LSD normally takes about 30 to 60 minutes to begin taking effect when it is eaten in normal doses, but thumbprints generally began to kick in within 10 or 15 seconds as the massive dose of LSD was quickly absorbed through capillaries and mucous membranes in the mouth. It tastes zingy, slightly metallic, he said. Then his pupils began to dilate before my eyes. His face went slack, and within seconds, I could tell the thumbprint had begun to change gears on him. His eyes began to fill with terror, and streams of light began to emanate from them. I know the difference between a hallucination and reality, and I was completely sober when I saw it. We all stood there speechless. China Cat began to walk forwards towards Smiley, his hands raised, as if approaching a madman with a gun. I think, Smiley said, hesitating, his face pale and his eyes searching like an animal in fear of ambush. I think we are in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. Smiley, are you? China Cat began to say, and then the world rippled all around us, the dunes of the desert flickering, as if some giant power source had just been activated. I looked behind me, gazing out across the endless desert for a long moment. 
I saw the dunes rising and falling, churning like ocean waves in a storm. In the flickering, mirage-like translucence of the world, I saw another world behind the desert, something horrible and dark. From the horizon, the darkness began to overtake the translucent dancing dunes, moving inwards towards us, changing the bright sands into a black, hellish landscape. The sun itself seemed to go out before returning for a few seconds, and then disappearing again, this time for good. Roads made of bones stretched across the flat, lifeless landscape as red clouds glowed overhead, covering the sky. The light that came through turned everything a shade of crimson, giving the packed earth a bloody glow. I turned toward Smiley, who I instinctively felt had somehow caused this. But he was gone. As the sun went out for the last time, and the strange, nighttime glow of this new world came over us, I saw something else standing in his place. It looked like a Halloween decoration, like a scarecrow crucified to some old splintering boards formed into a cross. Bones held together by rotten fragments of ligaments and tendons formed the shape of a human body, the skull hanging low over the chest. Black orbs appeared stuffed into the eye sockets, pure round balls that glimmered like obsidian. I stepped forward to examine the decoration closer when it raised its head. I screamed and jumped back, crashing into Ryan and Isabella. In a coarse, gurgling voice, the skeleton began to speak, its bleached jawbone opening and closing like a ventriloquist's dummy. I welcome all of you to the town of Scarville, he said, a town where no one hides for long. My name is Mr. Grin, and I already know all of yours. None of us spoke for a long moment, all of us shocked into silence by the bizarre events of the past couple minutes. The skeleton kept staring straight ahead, totally unmoving, like an eerie, grinning statue. He pulled against the nails driven straight through the larger bones in his palms, small cracks forming as the bones made a crackling noise. Is this some sort of manifestation of Smiley's mind? China Cat finally said, stepping forward. Did we accidentally get trapped inside his hallucination or something? Because this is bizarre. I always knew Smiley was different from other people, but... His voice trailed off as he looked around. I joined him, seeing buildings stretching out on the flat, black earth, long barracks that trailed off towards the horizon, and old, western-style bars and apartments lining the nearby street. The street itself looked like it had been made by fitting arm and leg bones together, millions of them laid side by side. The bones had yellowed with age, contrasting heavily with the black plains that extended in every direction, without any hills or valleys in sight. Oh no, Scarville is as real as you or me, he said, the grinning face of the skull moving to look at each of us in turn. Some people are windows, and others are doors. A few are bridges, but most are boars. He laughed at this, a grating, metallic sound that echoed through the silent town. How do we get out of here? I asked. The skeleton's head swiveled on his thin vertebrae, the glistening obsidian orbs of his eyes staring at me. I felt hypnotized as I stared back. If I knew that, Mr. Grin muttered in a low, choked voice, do you think I would still be here on this cross? I've lived in Scarville for a thousand years now, and it's always the same. A thousand years of dead earth, fire-red skies, and roaming nightmares, and I haven't found a way out yet. Munt. Our small group moved away from the skeleton man, deciding to palaver on what to do next. China Cat quickly took control of the conversation as he always had. He was the leader of our family in times of crisis, and this certainly counted as a crisis. I think we should take the skeleton down from the cross, he said. What? I asked, louder than I meant to. My voice seemed to echo back to me from the silent town. I felt like I had violated the sanctity of a graveyard. Lowering my voice, I continued, huddling closer to the group. Why in the hell would we take down that thing? China Cat shrugged. So, well, we need help and it is the only thing around for starters. I think it's Dehi, Isabella said, chiming in for the first time in the conversation. I looked at her in astonishment. I don't care if it's a goddamn whale, I said. It is a monster, a talking skeleton. Do we even know why he is crucified? China Cat shrugged. Let's ask him. I think we need a guide. Until we know what's going on here, 
we need to take any advantage we can get. I don't know where we are or how we got here, but I have a feeling that Smiley is behind it. If we can find him, then maybe we can get back to the desert, China Cat said. Do we have any weapons? Ryan asked, always the pragmatist. China Cat shook his head. I have some knives in the car, but the cars are gone back in the desert, he said. It's whatever we have in our pockets now, unless we can scrounge something up from around town. I have a keychain folding knife, I said, pulling out my pathetic little two-inch blade. Isabella waved her hands in front of her body in mock terror, saying, You, as if she were scared, and I laughed. I felt some of the tension relieved. I felt glad that at the very least I was in the company of friends who I trusted and loved. Let's go talk to the skell. China Cat began when the roaring started from the horizon. I looked up and saw a behemoth slowly floating across the barren earth. It had a humanoid form, yet it must have stood hundreds of feet tall. Giant reptilian wings fluttered lazily behind its massive body, curved and sharp like those of a dragon, topped with green bony spikes. Hundreds of long, writhing tentacles draped from the bottom of its face, slithering and undulating as they stretched out towards the ground. The Ancient Ones Awaken, Mr. Green whispered over and over, his head falling and racing, falling and racing. The Ancient Ones, the Ancient Ones. I felt a rush of air as the figure floated over the town, much of its massive head obscured by the low blood-red clouds. A tentacle as thick as a man's chest shot out and grabbed Ryan, wrapping around his body. It looked dry and dull, like the skin of a desert snake. Ryan's eyes went wide as it began to tighten around him. With a cracking of bones, I saw it crush him to death, blood pouring from his eyes, mouth, nose and ears as it compressed around his chest and neck. An explosion of blood shot out between the tentacles, a waterfall of blood streaming down the reptilian skin into the black dirt below. Screaming erupted from all around me as my friends scattered like cockroaches. Isabella, who had been standing next to Ryan, had drops of blood sprayed all over her body. A tentacle whipped over my head, crashing directly into Mr. Grin and the ground below him. The force shook the earth, reverberating like the aftershocks of an earthquake and almost causing me to trip and fall. I stumbled and had started to go down when a strong hand grabbed me by my upper arm and kept me on my feet. I looked over and saw China Cat, his face a mask of crushing sadness and mortal terror. Splinters of wood and bone went flying in all directions as Mr. Grin's skeletal body cracked into a thousand pieces. His skull separated from his body, his mouth flapping open and closed as an excited shriek came from his mouth. His head rolled to a stop a few feet in front of me. Looking up at me, he began to plead, his black eyes rolling furiously in their sockets, spinning like a top. Take me with you, he said. Without thinking, I stooped down and scooped up the head, rolling it into my arms. I saw China Cat and Isabella sprinting only a few feet in front of me, heading towards a nearby stone tower surrounded by dozens of rows of long wooden barracks. I saw small windows spiraling up the outside of it, like the murder holes in a medieval fort. I felt the air whooshing behind me as the massive reptilian creature floated above the town, its gigantic wings sending clouds of dust high above the ground. Its tentacles all seemed to move independently, like a den of snakes slithering over one another. Next to me, a thick green tentacle crashed into the barracks, caving in the roof and sending shards of glass scattering in all directions, shards that reflected the red glow of the sky like tiny red stars. China Cat reached the door of the stone tower first, as another tentacle crashed into the earth a few feet to my left. The ground shook, and a deep, vibrating thud rose through my bones. A smell like old leather and drying mushrooms rose from the creature's body, not overpowering or disgusting, but certainly alien and unique. As Isabella and I caught up with China Cat, he flung open the heavy metal door. The metal shrieked in protest as the rusty steel slowly rolled open on ancient hinges. He quickly disappeared into the darkness beyond the threshold as Isabella and I ran in behind him. I instantly felt the cool air of the tower overtake me as I ran onto the stone steps. I noticed they went both up and down, spiraling in both directions. Yet we were on the ground floor, so that must mean they connected to some sort of basement or tunnel system. 
Go down, Mr. Grin screamed as the tower shook, pieces of rock falling down from the ceiling. I glanced out one of the murder holes on the ground floor of the tower and saw a tentacle rushing towards me, swinging sideways in a blur. Like a massive battering ram, it hit the side of the tower. I felt something in its foundation give way as the stone began to tilt and groan overhead. We ran down the steps, quickly finding ourselves in total darkness as sounds of destruction continued incessantly above, sometimes shaking the ground. I heard the stairway collapse above us as a cloud of debris came rushing down the chamber. It overtook us like the dust clouds of a sandstorm, destroying any hope of returning back up the way we had come. The natural red glow went out as the tower collapsed. Coughing and choking, we stood in darkness. Everything above had gone deathly silent now, an eerie shift from the cacophony of shattering stones and falling rubble that had preceded it. Oh God, Isabella said, what was that? Her voice echoed in the blackness. I reached in my pocket and took out my phone, turning on the flashlight app. China Cat and Isabella blinked fast as their eyes adjusted. It killed Ryan, I said bitterly, a wave of emotion overtaking me. It killed my friend. Mr. Grin's eyes spun in their sockets as I held him in my hands. China Cat came over and put a hand on my shoulder, and I could see my own depression and loss reflected in his face. Even now, a day later, I haven't fully accepted that he is dead. After a few moments, we started to walk forwards, descending further into the tunnel. I saw torches lining the sides of the wall, their small flames sputtering in the dusty air. I turned off my flashlight, deciding to save the battery. We seemed to have descended dozens of stories, but the stairs kept going. I smelled something like limestone and cool streams, with other fouler scents mixed in. I thought I smelled burning meat and rotting carcasses, but it was very faint. That was one of the ancient ones, Mr. Grin said. There's a few others. Do they all look like that? China Cat asked. No, no, not at all, Mr. Grin said cheerily, seeming not at all saddened by the loss of his body. He actually seemed far more excited and upbeat than at any time since we first met him. Perhaps he was just happy to be down off that cross for the first time in, well, who knows. Have you seen the other ones? Isabella asked. Mr. Grin nodded in my hands, his hard, bony skull bobbing up and down rapidly apparently enjoying the topic of conversation. Oh yes, Mr. Grin said. The one we just met was Chorus the Destroyer. He has the most followers and the most power here in Scarville. The others tend to leave him alone, mostly because they're scared shitless of him. His priests control most of the surrounding area with an iron fist. Anyone not in the hierarchy gets hunted or sacrificed to Chorus. They have nearly all the food around here, you see, and they use it like a weapon allowing anyone they consider beneath them to starve to death. China Cat nodded, his face yet again placid, as if he were dealing with some abstract philosophical matter. And what do the other ones look like? Isabella whispered, her eyes gleaming with excitement. She seemed to be extremely interested in the topic. Mr. Grin took notice, delivering a theatrical response in his gravelly, deep voice. The other ones, he said. The other ones. They look like hell itself, my lady. There is Kristen Mock the Bloody. Much smaller than Chorus, only twenty feet tall, but he's been here a long time as well. His followers drain the blood of anyone they capture so he can bathe in it and drink it. Kristen Mock looks much more human than Chorus, except he's all twisted. His skin is bloodless and white, and his fingernails look like claws. His fingers, arms, and legs are very long and crooked, and his eyes are silver and glowing. Most people avoid Kristen Mack and his priests like the plague. Well, besides those two, there's the Wandering King. I saw him in his procession pass by only once. He looks demonic, his skin blazing red. He stands forty feet tall and has a staff made of blazing fire. He has four arms, long and skeletal, the red skin stretched tight across the bone, and his face looks like melting wax. It constantly changes as you stare at it, the eyes stretching out and shrinking, the skin dripping away then reforming. It's actually a little gross, even to me. But what are these things? I asked. Mr. Grin's smile seemed to falter, even though he was a skull and couldn't possibly have smiled. He also couldn't have nodded his head though, and I had seen him do that. 
And where did his voice even come from? The head wasn't attached to anything. Putting these issues aside, I decided to focus on the greatest threat, the Ancient Ones. Mr. Grin had turned out to be a wealth of information. I felt relieved we had him in our group. They're the ones who first came to Scarville, he said. I don't know how long ago. Thousands of years, yes, maybe tens of thousands. People come wandering in here from all over the place. They mostly come and die, but a few survive and continue. And yet the Ancient Ones are constant, the true power in the land, and their followers reap the rewards. As he stopped talking, I realized I heard something. A soft pattering came near, like muted footsteps. At that moment, I realized we had finally reached the bottom of the stairs, and now a curving limestone tunnel stood in front of us. Everything looked wet. Small rivulets of water dribbled their way down the walls, and drops fell from the ceiling. A little girl came around the corner. Grime and dirt covered every inch of her skin, and she wore layers of tattered clothes. Her hair, blonde in some spots, was so filthy it had turned black or brown in most others. She smelled like sickness and sweat, and as she opened her mouth to speak, she gave a little cough that turned into a long, choking one, bending over and trying to get her wind back. Who are you? She said with a strange, drawling accent as she straightened back up. Why did you come down here? We don't have to answer your questions, Mr. Grin said, his chattering mouth exploding in an angry explosion of noise. He turned to me, his voice turning low and conspiratorial, as if he were a prisoner talking of escape. Don't trust anyone in this place. These people are refugees from above. I've heard people talk about the tunnels down here. They call it Cannibal's Row. The girl looked us up and down for a few long moments, then turned around and ran back the way she came. That was bizarre, Isabella said. We began to walk forwards around the bend in the stone. Rooms branched off the sides at random points, their small doorways and tight dimensions hewn out of the rock itself. I had to kneel to inspect the first room. From the flickering torchlight of the hall I could see a skeletal corpse in the corner, its legs and arms totally gone, its torso, head and hips were still clothed in a gray uniform. The uniform looked ratty and threadbare with numerous holes. I walked closer, squinting, feeling I had seen this uniform before. The medals and swastika pin proved this was a Wehrmacht soldier from the time of Nazi Germany. I saw an eagle with its wings extended holding a sword. Holy shit, Isabella said behind me. That is so cool. How did he get here? I shrugged, looking down at Mr. Grin. Mr. Grin seemed pleased by all the attention, and he responded quickly with the enthusiasm of a game show host. Bridges pop up here and doorways there. Nubluta Revis and is quickly spilled. Since ancient times all the endless fear echoes here when they're wounded or killed. So you're saying that if we looked hard enough, we might find evidence of soldiers from ancient Rome and ancient Egypt here, I asked. Mr. Grin's skull turned to face me. Oh yes, he said, and long before that. We walked ahead for another ten minutes, around curving turns and past branching tunnels that seemed to lead farther down into the earth. Mr. Grin said he had never been down here and didn't know the way. The only thing he did know was that Cannibal's Row apparently existed down here. From what he described, it was like a combination of a slum and the ninth circle of hell. A few minutes later, we came on it. We saw trash everywhere, littering the stone floor of the tunnel. Everything from bones to used cloth diapers to scraps of bloody bandages had been dumped here, and people walked over it. Dozens of them streamed in all directions, men, women, and children wearing rags and covered in dirt and grime. They stayed in small groups and gave the others distrustful glares. One woman, filthy and missing an eye, gripped some food to her chest. She gave us a suspicious glance and a wide berth, moving to the other side of the hallway. I looked over as she passed and saw what she held tight to her tattered shirt. A baby lay there, dead and naked. It had been roasted its skin turned dark and cracked from the heat of the fire, its tiny eyes closed and mouth hanging open, as if still trying to cry in death. More people followed further down the hall, holding other strange parcels of mysterious meats to their bodies, like shoppers from the crowds of hell. I looked into the rooms carved out of the stone on both sides, seeing disgusting, bug-ridden beds. Rats and snakes slithered over the floor, and in one room, 
I saw men and women missing limbs laying on blood-soaked sheets covering the floor. The smell of infection and human waste emanated from the room like a cloud, thick and pungent, and some of them cried constantly while others just stared up at the ceiling with dead, blank eyes. As we went around another turn looking for a way out of this nightmarish place, my worst fear became realized. Isabella was in the lead, with China Cat and I walking a few feet behind her. This would turn out to be a mistake. I saw a blur as a filthy, bearded man with a paint mask over his mouth jumped out of a dark room on our right, hidden by the curve of the wall. As he breathed, the crumpled mask sucked in and out, the dirt and blood covering it making its original color unrecognizable. He had on a white biohazard suit that had yellowed with age, covered in dark black and red stains that littered its surface. Reminders of past atrocities that would never wash away. He was emaciated and sickly looking with sunken eyes that glistened in his bony face like a snake staring out of the sockets of an animal's skull. Deep in those dark eyes, I saw a tiny glimmer of light. Far down in that well of nothingness and despair he radiated. Scars and sores littered the exposed area of his face, long slashes and infected round pustules that constantly dribbled yellow viscous flood and blood down his starving body. Wheezing and coughing, he pressed the knife against Isabella's neck, and I saw a drop of blood start to wind its way down her skin, dribbling over the soft hollow at the bottom and into her white shirt. Her blue eyes looked around wildly, the eyes of a panicked and cornered animal seeing no way out. I'm taking the girl, the man said. China Cat walked forward, his hands raised, radiating peace. You don't have to do this, brother, he said. The man scoffed. Yes, I do, one brother, he said sarcastically. I haven't eaten in a week. This girl has plenty of meat on her bones. She'll feed us well. He smiled, showing rotted yellow teeth and gums covered in black, oozing sores. If you try to follow me, I'll kill her, got it? I have nothing to lose. I'll skin her alive, inch by inch. He began walking backwards with the knife still pressed tightly to her neck. He took a small, branching alleyway to the left ten feet down, disappearing in the dark crack in an instant. I looked at China Cat with wide eyes. We have to go get her, I said. We better go now then, Mr. Grin said in a detached voice. The trail grows cold quickly in these parts. And we started running then, China Cat's old body heaving deep breaths as we disappeared in the thin alleyway that ran off of Cannibal's Row. There were no torches here, and the darkness became absolute within a few steps. The man must know these paths like the back of his hand, I thought to myself. I turned on the flashlight app on my phone, seeing China Cat reach into his pocket and do the same. The path we followed looked like a natural cavern, far different from the chiseled halls and rooms of Cannibal's Row. I saw stalagmites and stalactites, mostly small ones only a few inches long, and the walls had a wet, shiny look to them. We ran as fast as we could, but I saw no sign of the man or Isabella. I wondered how they got so far ahead of us. Then I heard an agonized moaning sound coming from up ahead. I reached in my pocket and pulled out the knife, the one Isabella had made fun of. On the right I saw a natural indentation in the cavern wall, one that led into a tiny chamber only a few feet tall. I saw bodies laid down on the hard stone ground bodies with missing limbs that I thought were dead until they moved their hands and heads to look up at my light. I saw Isabella, her hands and feet tied with a rope. Then the man in the crumpled paint mask rushed out, his knife pointed at my heart. I saw it all happening in slow motion. He had to crouch to get out, and it gave me a moment of leverage over him. Instinctively, I struck out with my knife. Since he was bent over, it was the perfect height to strike at his neck. I watched the blade sink into the side of his throat, feeling him punch me in the side at the same moment. Then, his eyes widened, and he fell over, blood gushing from his neck. Daddy, no! The little girl from the beginning of the tunnel cried, rushing out of the small room and holding her bleeding father as his paint mask continued to suck in and out with his last few breaths. I looked at it all, feeling dissociated, as if I were watching someone else's life. That was a close one. I whispered, looking down to see a knife sticking out of my leg. The pain hit me all at once as blood poured from the wound, making my jeans stick to my skin. I fell down, 
yelling out for help. China Cat ran over to me and I wondered at that moment if I was dying. The people in the cavern who had their limbs amputated continued to moan and whimper as waves of pain overtook me. Laying on the cold stone floor, I continued to look up at China Cat when a commotion began behind us. It's okay, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna make it through this, he said to me, putting pressure on the wound. I felt spurts of warm blood rushing out in time with my heartbeat. He took a belt and wrapped it around the leg, tightening it to reduce the bleeding. Make way for the herald, someone shouted in a deep gravelly voice that echoed through the stone tunnels. You swine, you subhumans, move aside. I looked down the dark tunnel, seeing lanterns heading in our direction. Men in purple robes walked in our direction. Soldiers armed with swords surrounded them on both sides, swearing at anyone who didn't move fast enough, pushing and shoving people. Occasionally, I would hear a whispering, emotionless voice say, take that one, he's good for the master, or that child there, grab her. By the time they got to us, the procession had dozens of prisoners, bound up in chains and linked together. I saw the soldiers grabbing an old man from a small cavern, forking off the side of the main tunnel, punching him in the side of the head for no reason. He crumpled to the ground. One soldier with a face like an angry bulldog knelt down, chaining the old man's hands and roughly lifting him to his feet. The old man swayed like a boxer before a knockout, and the soldier slapped him hard across the face. China Cat had cut Isabella's bindings with the same knife I had used to kill the man in the filthy paint mask. She knelt over me as he began to cut away part of my jeans to look at the wound closer. Well, I don't think it hit any arteries, China Cat said, but you really need stitches. I don't know where we're going to get those around here. You should try to walk on it as little as possible, and you definitely won't be running any marathons. I'm going to die here, aren't I? I asked. The men in the purple robes had closed in on us by this point. The soldiers in front began shouting at China Cat and Isabella. Take them, the same low, whispery voice said. I saw it came from a short, elderly priest, with a hunched back and thin wisps of hair that looked as airy and white as dandelion seeds. He had cold green eyes that regarded us like slabs of meat. He looked at my spurting leg. If the injured one can't walk, kill him. I can walk, I exclaimed through gritted teeth. I wasn't actually too sure of that, but I certainly had no intention of letting myself get butchered here on a stone floor this far from home. I rose slowly, looking at the knife embedded in my leg. It hadn't struck the bone, but had gone clean through the outer layers of skin and muscle. Squeezing my eyes shut, I pulled the knife out, slowly, centimeter by centimeter. It felt like hot pins burning inside my flesh, but a few seconds later, it came sliding out, a waterfall of dark blood flowing out behind it. Let's go, the soldier behind me said. Hands behind your back. I saw China Cat slide the head of Mr. Grin into his shirt, tucking it into his pants. It was extremely obvious, but the soldiers didn't seem to care what he had in his shirt in the slightest. They chained my hands, then chained Isabella and China Cat, putting us in the line of half-starved prisoners. I saw a prisoner look down at the bulge in China Cat's clothing. What's that you got there, meat? Bread? The thin man in front of us asked turning and staring at the bulge for a long moment. None of your business, China Cat said gruffly, and the man just laughed. Mr. Grin stayed strangely quiet. You won't have long to eat it if it is, he said cryptically. You're better off sharing it with us now if it is. It isn't food, he responded. The man turned back around as the line began to move forwards. I leaned heavily on China Cat, as waves of fire ran up and down my bleeding leg. China Cat saw the glances other prisoners gave him, and he handed me the head of Mr. Grin. I tucked it into my shirt. I looked back, seeing the old man who the soldiers had beat stood almost directly next to me. The right side of his face had already begun to swell, a rapidly darkening purple bruise giving him a squinted, one-sided look. But it was clear that this wasn't the first indignity heaped upon his face. His right cheek had deep melted scars that ran in keloid folds down to his jaw. 
The eye on that side had withered like a shrunken grape. It stared out blindly without a pupil or iris, as smooth and white as a pebble worn by a river. Good fortune, friend, he said in a quivering voice, though I don't know how good it will be for any of us now. You too, I said, returning his strange greeting. Who are these people? Where are they taking us? I saw Isabella and China Cat lean in, listening intently to the conversation. I limped slowly along, occasionally leaning on China Cat for support. The chains around us clinked like dull metal bells. I saw dirty silhouettes of starving men, women and children scattering like cockroaches before the light as the column of armed men and priests advanced down the stone passage. The old man leaned close to me, examining my face and clothes. You're not from around here, are you? He asked. I saw he had an old leather belt wrapped around his thin waist. He had cut new holes farther and farther along the length of it, markers of his increasing emaciation as his body wasted away until he looked like a concentration camp inmate. He wasn't the only one either. Looking down the line, I saw vertebrae bulging through thin, sallow skin and legs and arms that looked like metal rods wrapped in a minuscule layer of flesh. The old man wore a strange kind of tattered cloth the color of swamp water. He nodded his head sagely at me, answering his own question. No, I can see you're not from around here. I haven't seen clothes like that since. He stopped, looking up at me with an anxious expression. Since when? Isabella asked, curious. He looked over at her with surprise, as if he didn't even know she was there. Since the High Priest of Chorus first came into our world, he said. But that was fifty years ago. What is your name, old man? China Cat asked. The old man turned at him with weary, watery eyes, the eyes of an old dog about to be put to sleep. Abraham, he answered in a quivering voice. We introduced ourselves and asked him about what had happened fifty years ago. The line began marching down a corridor I had never seen before, taking more and more prisoners as it went. I saw red light streaming in an opening far away, no more than a pinpoint. Emaciated and dirty people scattered into side tunnels and slunk into shadows, the soldiers grabbing some at random and adding them to the ever-increasing chain. They seemed like they were just trying to fill a quota and didn't care who they chose. And then Abraham told us a story that turned my world upside down. He called himself Smiley, he said, but he said his real name was Stephen Carmine. Everyone knew it when he showed. His arrival had been marked by seers and prophets for hundreds of years. The followers of the Ancient Ones predicted a great king would arise who would conquer the warring armies and unite the land under one leader. When he finally appeared at the Well of Voices, stars began to fall from the bloody sky above, meteorites that struck the earth all around us with countless blows. Quite a few people died and many houses and temples got smashed to bits under the crushing weight of the falling stones from the sky. He shook his head grimly. Omens of things to come, I'll tell you. Chorus had been rampaging across the town that day, as he usually did every couple years before traveling to far-off lands and inevitably returning. He ignored the meteorites, as if they were no more than flies buzzing around his head. They would hit his heavy scales and bounce off with nary a mark or dent but all the commotion seemed to have driven him into a killing frenzy. He had begun grabbing random people with his tentacles and chewing them with his many mouths. Many mouths? I asked. I hadn't seen any mouths. It felt like my heart would burst out of my chest as he recounted the story. I couldn't believe he had said Smiley's name, but more importantly, I thought it might even become essential for our survival. Abraham nodded. Yes, behind the tentacles, if you ever see them lifted, he has dozens of strange, teeth-filled holes. It almost reminds me of a lamprey or an eel, with the spongy, black gums and the teeth jutting out in spirals. Each of the mouths chews on its own, and it helps him consume prey faster, I assume. Animals can change over time, so why not whatever Chorus is? You mean like evolution? Isabella asked. Are there more like Chorus here? Abraham shook his head. No, thank God he is the last. The others were killed in the wars that swept through Scarville after Smiley arrived. 
They each had their own priests and soldiers who followed and worshipped them. Can the priest talk to Chorus? I asked. He smiled grimly. Only the high priests ever communicate with the beasts directly. We don't know how they do it. They have to undergo some sort of secret surgery, I hear. Their tongues get sliced in half, until they're like the forked tongues of a serpent. Only then can they speak in the language of the Ancient Ones, a queer, hissing kind of speech. I was just a young man when the High Priest Smiley arrived. I lived at the edge of town. My family were farmers. We grew the edible Caracas root, which spreads very easily under the fiery red light of Scarville. Nearly all of our meals back then consisted of root vegetables and herbs, never any meat. No, the High Priest would send their armies in and take any livestock we had as tribute. It was much different back then. Smaller versions of Chorus, which we called the Ancient Ones, rampaged across the country. They would gather armies, cult members who would sacrifice prisoners of war to the reptilian gods. Everyone in the town was armed and ready to fight at a moment's notice. The Well of Voices had become a site of pilgrimage for us, as the holy men in our town said it could tell the future. It was just a massive natural rock well formed into a perfect circle about the length of a man across. It went down so far that you couldn't see the water. People had climbed down on ropes to the sacred waters below, but it had taken them hours and much rope. The sacred waters had a light gold color and always tasted sweet and refreshing, but it was the voices that echoed up from the well during rainstorms that truly brought the pilgrims streaming in. For centuries, voices had babbled in many languages, seeming to adjust each towards the natural language of the listeners present. People thought the voices would predict the future, and they listened closely to the words that echoed up the endless, smooth stone of the well. The day the high priest arrived, though, there was no rain. The holy men who built their huts around the well heard screaming echoing up from far below, faint and eerie. They immediately summoned the strongest young men from the town, who got their strongest ropes, and began climbing down, Hours later, they emerged carrying a wet, exhausted young man, wearing clothes just like yours. I had heard rumors of a commotion in the market in town and had gone to investigate. Thankfully, I had not been present when Chorus began his rampage. However, my parents had both been in the house. It collapsed on them and killed them instantly. I didn't find their bodies until days later, when rescuers finally cleared most of the rubble away. It would have been far worse. But when the young men brought this man Smiley into town on a mule-drawn carriage, Smiley had seen Chorus from a long distance away. He instantly rose, as if revived by the sight of such a monster. He yelled at the driver to stop and in a fit of mania, he ran towards the rampaging beast. He began crying at Chorus, and though he didn't have the forked tongue, the beast stopped and looked at him. Chorus tilted his head, almost like a dog, it would have been comical were he not surrounded by the crushed bodies of his victims at the time. Chorus picked up the man Smiley, with one of his long, writhing tentacles, bringing him up to his great dragon's eyes. With slitted pupils, I saw him regard the man for a long moment. I expected the tentacle to begin squeezing, and the man to be crushed into a bloody paste, but that's not at all what happened. Instead, Chorus' pupils dilated and his snake-like nostrils flared, and he began to shriek endlessly. The sound shook the ground. He immediately ran off, taking the man with him. I don't know what Chorus saw in him, but it looked like sheer terror. The next thing I knew, the man had somehow met the priests of Chorus, and he learned about the ritual. They had seen the connection shared between him and the beast, and they immediately approved him for the tongue-slicing ritual. He learned to talk to the beast, and he controlled it like no other priest. The beast seemed... afraid... somehow... It would begin to quiver and roar when Smiley drew near, bringing the sacrifices of prisoners of war, or, if that failed, anyone they could grab. We made it outside by this point, going up a sloping dirt ramp that led into the flat black plains that seemed to go on forever, with roads made of bones stretching out to every horizon. I blinked quickly, limping as I went, feeling fresh drops of blood still running down my leg. Yet the bleeding seemed to have slowed slightly, and though I felt lightheaded, probably from the blood loss and pain, I knew I had to push myself and keep going. Ahead of us, I saw a platform made of skulls five feet tall, and on top of it stood a silver throne. 
In the chair, surrounded by the bones of thousands of people, I saw my friend, Smiley. Yet he had aged greatly. I could tell it was the same man, but he now looked 70 or 80 years old. He had a face as wrinkled as a raisin, the skin leathery and pale. The eyes were the same. They seemed to crackle with intensity and inner fervor. Smiley looked over the crowd of prisoners, all chained together in a streaming mass of humanity. Then soldiers began yelling, and we came to a stop. The soldier next to me looked me up and down with bleary eyes. We're not going to check what you have and find a human head that you've eaten, right, subhuman? The soldier said in disgust. I shook my head quickly. He spat on the ground and moved away. Mr. Grin is awfully quiet, China Cat whispered. I wonder why. We have bigger problems, I said, looking around for any advantage. I only had a few things on me, including Mr. Grin's skull tucked into my shirt, a bloody pocket knife and maybe a million hits of LSD in a glass vial in my pocket. I saw we had arrived on a flat dirt field where long tables were set up. Intricate carvings of reptilian faces stared out from the edges and legs of the tables. A massive punch bowl five feet wide and a few feet tall was filled to the brim with some golden-colored alcoholic drink a few steps away from me. I think it may have been honeymead. Next to it, plate after plate of roast duck, slices of beef, smoked pork, rice, bread, pies, and chocolates laden the tables. Some seemed to bow slightly under the intense weight of so many dishes. The smell of cooking meat, fresh bread, honey, and baking cakes permeated the air. My stomach growled and I wondered when I ate last, or when I would eat again, if ever. Then an idea came to me. I looked around, seeing no one looking at me. The herald and his priests stood around Smiley, leaning over and whispering something to him. I saw a scowl forming on his face. I checked the perimeter guard, seeing the soldiers still laughing and talking. They stood in a circle around the chained prisoners, regarding them with apathy. Chorus won't be here for another hour, I heard one complain. He won't come for the subhumans until the night arrives and the fires blaze here on every pyre, which means we might as well start drinking and eating. He shook his head angrily. I hate waiting around. I felt in my pockets the handcuffs jingling with a harsh metallic ringing. After a few seconds I found it. I took out the vial of LSD, unstoppered the top, and with a prayer, I crept next to the punch bowl trying to act confused and inconspicuous. I didn't make eye contact with anyone as I lifted the vial above the edge of the bowl, hiding it with my body as much as I could. I poured the LSD into the great wooden bowl. The silvery white crystals dissolved into the golden-colored liquid in an instant. Within the next few minutes, servant after servant came over, drawing from the bowl to bring drinks to all of the soldiers and most important people. Mr. Grin laughed inside my shirt, drawing startled glances from all the prisoners around me. Good thinking, cowboy he said. I hope that doesn't backfire on you. Well, what else do you expect me to do? I whispered, looking like a lunatic. A few people gave me strange glances, as if they thought I were talking to myself. Oh no, you made the right call, Mr. Grin said. I just hope you kept a little for emergencies. You're not out of the woods yet, but I digress. Let's just watch and wait. We did, and it didn't take long. Within a few minutes, soldiers and priests began falling over, their dilated pupils staring up at the sky with terrified faces. Some of them started screaming, and I saw a few strip naked and begin running around, howling like wolves as they turned their faces up to the crimson sky. I looked up at Smiley, seeing him holding a cup of meat in his shaky, withered hand. I still couldn't get over how much he had aged. His scowl turned to an expression of confusion, as he continued to drink from the cup. When the soldiers started falling over and laughing or screaming, he rose from his chair looking directly at me. A flash of recognition came over his face, but it disappeared as quickly as it had arrived and confusion took over again. Hope started to fade in my heart as I saw his face go slack and dumb. I saw a cloud of dust heading towards us from the horizon, a cloud that reached nearly up to the sky. I wondered if it was Chorus here for the sacrifices. What would he do when he arrived and found his cult members all running around or laying on the ground with heads full of acid? But it wasn't Chorus. Chorus had not arrived yet. 
Someone else had, though. From far away, I saw half-naked men with faces painted red or blue. They all had spears, swords, and crossbows. Leading them in the charge, I saw something horrible. The Wandering King, Mr. Grin said from inside my shirt, sounding terrified. I shivered at the name. The creature towered above his armies, standing taller than a two-story house. His face constantly changed, the bones seeming to reform and move around under the tight red skin like tectonic plates in the earth, shifting and grinding during massive earthquakes. A staff made of flame sat in his two skeletal right hands. His two left arms kept waving the armies forward. Kill them, he roared with a cacophonous voice that shook the ground. Kill the followers of Koras, leave no one alive, rip them apart, cut their throats, crucify the enemy. Oh God, I think it's time to go, China Cat said. I nodded. I looked around, seeing a soldier laying on the ground nearby. A ring of keys jingled around his coarse leather belt. I moved as close as I could, held back by the chains, but I reached my arm forwards and just managed to close my hand around his foot. I started dragging him towards me, fresh blood pouring down my leg from the effort. I could use some help here, I said to Isabella and China Cat through gritted teeth. They each grabbed part of his leg and dragged him between us. His eyes were blank and his pupils blown wide open, pure black orbs that roved constantly over the crimson sky. He muttered to himself, Oh, it's just the wind, it's caught fire again, he whispered. The tornadoes are coming. The sun exploded and I saw it. I think it melted my eyes. Grab his keys, I ordered. Let's get the fuck out of here. There was only one person who I believed had the power to bring us back to our world from Scarville. He sat on a throne of silver laid on top of thousands of bones, tripping on a high dose of LSD. As soon as we had unchained ourselves, we began moving towards Smiley. Every time I looked at the army following the Wandering King, they seemed closer and closer, not more than a few minutes away by this point. Smiley's personal guards and priests had all drunk the mead, and most had wandered off or laid on the ground, talking to themselves. Some just ran away like demons from hell were hot on their heels. I knew the soldiers of Chorus could not formulate any real defense in this condition. Our only chance to survive was to rouse Smiley and have him take us out of here. Smiley, Isabella cried as she reached his massive throne. He looked at us blankly. I took Mr. Grin out of my shirt. The skull grinned up at me, its black eyes excited and pulsating. It's us, Isabella and China Cat and Jay. We're here, man. We're finally here. Her voice broke and she started to cry. We need to get out of here now, China Cat said to him. Smiley shifted his eyes slowly and robotically to China Cat. I couldn't tell if he even knew where he was or what was going on. If we don't get out of here in the next couple minutes, we're going to be slaughtered. You understand that, right? Smiley didn't say anything or react in any way. I sighed. Perhaps you can reach him, Mr. Grin offered, by reminding him of the true nature of reality. The true nature of... China Cat said. Mr. Grin sighed. Where you were when he opened the portal, Mr. Grin said, where a part of him still is now. The desert, Isabella cried. We're in a desert with trailers, right? And there's a leather-bound Bible. Smiley's eyes widened, and he looked directly at Isabella. You saw that too? He slurred. How did you know about my dreams and nightmares? They're not dreams, Isabella cried. That's the real world, and we need to go there now. I looked nervously at the armies approaching us. They roared with a frenzied bloodlust. I could see the black, filthy beards hanging down from their scarred faces. We stood no chance if we were still here when they reached us. They would tear us apart in an instant. Smiley stood suddenly, grabbing China Cat's hand. China Cat? He asked in a quavering old man's voice. China Cat nodded. It's me, buddy. I'm here for you, he said. China Cat looked nervously at Mr. Grin. So what now? Do I have to do everything? Mr. Grin grumbled. Tell him to open his third eye and concentrate on the desert. That's how he got here in the first place. He thought this place only existed in his nightmares, but clearly 
he didn't realize he was experiencing another true world. Maybe he doesn't realize your world is real either, but he better realize it quickly, otherwise. The wandering king was now only a few hundred feet away. He sprinted in front of his armies, his blood-red robe rippling around his legs. His face kept changing and melting, the eyes reforming into nightmarish spectacles. They changed from reptilian to insectoid to bovine. The mouth opened like a black hole, without teeth or a tongue. It fell open, and he shrieked his battle cry. Then he ran into the first line of Chorus's soldiers and prisoners, and I knew it was too late. Nun, I remember, Smiley said, excited. I can see it clearly, as clearly as I see all of you. Then take us there, Isabella cried. Now, run it through your third eye and keep increasing the power until... But that was all she got out before the screams of the dying and injured started to reach use. I looked at the armies of the Wandering King as they stabbed and decapitated dozens of people on the perimeter. The Wandering King was looking directly at Smiley, shrieking with a voice like thunder to kill, kill, kill. He began running towards us, his black hole of a mouth taking up nearly a quarter of his body. He looked like a red skeletal banshee, his fiery staff held high as he crushed one person after another beneath his red-robed feet. I heard bones shatter, and a sound like trickling water as blood poured from crushed and mutilated bodies onto the dark earth below. As he closed in, within a couple dozen feet of us, I had a crazy idea. I took the vial of LSD out of my pocket, aimed it, and threw. It sailed through the air in a lazy arc, and an instant later, I saw it land in the wandering king's gaping mouth. A small tinkle of glass shattering rang out through the air. The wandering king kept coming, but after a few steps, he stopped. He looked around, confused, and his face began to melt and change faster and faster. It's opening! Smiley cried. I saw light streaming from his body, forming an arch behind him. Through it, I saw the desert we had come from. Without looking back, we all ran through, and with a popping sound, it closed behind us. When we got back, I saw Smiley had returned to his old self. He wasn't some 80-year-old man anymore, but the Smiley in his 20s, the one we all knew. He had fallen sometime in the chaos, and now he slowly sat up, grinning his crooked half-smile as he looked us all up and down. I still had Mr. Grin's skull in my hands, and his black eyes shone with excitement. So, Smiley said, laughing, crazy trip, huh? We packed up and left, and to this day I still have Mr. Grin in my room. He's happy to be out of Scarville, and so am I for that matter. I hope I never see that foul place again. <laughs>